Well, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Zoom opening for Intersections with Dante Marioni and uh, the Montague Gallery. I am Donnie Montague, and I'm here with my husband, Gary Montague. <laughs> so we're pleased to see you all, and we're excited to bring uh, Dante to you today. Um, the show is breathtaking, absolutely fabulous. Um, a few things that I want you to know before we get started. Um, all of the pieces, with the exception of one, were done this year in 2021. So what you're going to see is the uh, very newest uh, body of, of work of Dante's. And you'll see, we're going to be showing a video and you'll see on this video that uh, what Dante is doing is really uh, exploiting the properties of glass and you're going to see intersections of lines and intersections of patterns. And you're going to, to see amazing movement and energy where as you walk past uh, one of his pieces, you get this really beautiful moiré effect. So this is a, a special show where this is our opening day. The show runs through Saturday, May 22nd. And um, in just a minute, I'm going to ask Dante to uh, say a few words, but I want you to know that we're recording this session. It's going to be posted. Um, you all will be muted throughout the session. Um, we're going to have, a, as I said, a five-minute video. And, um, you know, just heads up, it's a visual treat. Um, Dante's work is meant for video and it's really meant to see in person as as those of you who know glass know there's no way to see it you know best other than being in person but um a still shot of his work just does not explain what it is and you'll see in this video what i mean by that um and then after we show the video uh i will ask dante a few questions and we're going to open the chat box and then you will be able to ask questions um, and then via chat. via chat. And then some way, somewhere along the way, we're also gonna take a, a little studio tour of, uh, with Dante. Dante is at his studio in Seattle. So it's gonna be fun. Um, so with that, Dante, will you uh, tell us a little bit about this show and kind of sort of give us an overview on it? Okay. Um, I started to, uh, make the pieces, the maze pieces, I think probably two years ago, maybe more, I don't really recall. And, um, I, it was a little bit of a departure, well, departure because I was making the things like that that are, that are also, you know, the more right We lost some of your sound. We, Dante, we lost some of your audio. Uh, anyway, I started making the maze pieces first a few years back. I like what you said about exploiting the uh, glassiness. Is that what you, how you said it, Donnie? Like the you, properties you know. of glass. Yes. Yeah, I like that because uh, I've never really done that. My the early work that I made, uh, which was a long time ago now, was always um, opaque color and and uh, more complicated forms. Really, really super glass blowery, like the pictures with the handles and the flask and the bowl and all that stuff was just really uh, hard to do and very fussy stuff. And it was about, it was about that. It was more about glass blowing to me than it was the finished thing or, or uh, anything else. Whereas the stuff that I've been doing lately is exploiting the properties of the glass and that, you know, there's no way you could make these objects out of anything other than glass because they're all transparent and they are exploiting the properties of the material. <laughs> I'm gonna use that line from now on. So I made, uh, the, um, it was actually about a year ago, uh, almost exactly, 13 months ago, I was working at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. We were the, I was the last, John Kiley and I, my buddy, were the last people to work at the museum before they turned it off for the whole pandemic thing. I came back up here and I talked to Janusz Pozniak as the guy that I work with in my studio and I have for almost 30 years. 
And uh, he was like, no, we can't turn it off because he had stuff to do. And I just, I don't know why, now that I think back on it, we thought we had to turn everything off, probably because everybody else turned their furnaces off last yeah. March. So instead we worked and I started making this, these print pieces. So, and, and I was like essentially just kind of sequestered here in the studio. I live in this building too, as does Yanush. So we sort of quarantined together while we each made work. And um, the results for me were the print pieces and the way that I make those uh, is somewhat similar to how I make the maze pieces in that it starts by pulling a whole bunch of cane. And um, we do that by, by, what I mean by that is uh, some color with clear glass around it and then you stretch it into a big long uh, a cane, a big long rod. Generally we do it down the hallway here because it's almost always raining. But if it's not raining, we can go down the driveway outside and make much bigger ones. And then with the canes, I either chop them up and arrange them into a, this is a maze piece in progress right here. They take about eight hours to mm. chop up and do. It's tedious. And uh, that's what happens with, to make a maze. But then to make the uh, print pieces, what I do is I pick up a whole bunch of canes on a glow pipe and I make one of these. This is your traditional rondelle, but it's not very traditional and that it's made out of cane and it has a hole in the middle because I just pick up the canes and then um, constrict them and bonk it off the pipe. It's never a bubble. It's just canes twisted, picked up. And then I have a little sheet of glass. It takes about four of these to make a print because I can't use every bit of it. I have to have, uh, as you can see here, the scraps from this is the most recent one. I just set this up uh, yesterday, actually, or I finished mm. it yesterday. Cool. So that's how these things happen. And the print came to be, um, I mean, it just seemed like an obvious sort of uh, progression from what I was already doing, the mazes. And, um, the work, the objects largely, like when I first conceived them, I was sort of thinking about this series that the artist Bryce Martin made, the painter, the American painter. I've always been a big fan of his work and it just keeps getting better, his work, as far as I'm concerned. But he did some pieces in or a series called Cold Mountain mm -hmm. in, the, in the 90s, I think. And there were really more drawings that he did with the stick that looked kind of like, I think his inspiration was like, Chinese calligraphy, something like this. And, and um, they bear no resemblance to this, but I, I, that's just kind of what I was thinking about when I started conceiving these pieces, like the maze is chopping stuff up and rearranging them and getting these kooky lines. Mm -hmm. And I try to do them, like I do the, the, the maze pieces, I try to do both halves the same. If you look at this plate here, you can see I have it, uh, there's, I've drawn on it with pencil and there's, it's divided in half. And both halves will be the same so that when I fold it over and, and uh, when I squeeze the piece together, like to make the object flat, the two halves will hopefully pretty, pretty close to line up. And then it really does the kooky. Right, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. All right, well, that is a great overview to <laughs> what you're gonna see next on the video. So let's take a look at our video walkthrough of the show. And then we'll come back and uh, continue talking with Dante. All right? Cool. Thanks. Sure.
<laughs> nice job. Really, really good. Well, you, you make it fun with that work. It, it, would, it wouldn't be really good without that work. So no, thank it would you. It would be kind of empty, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would. <laughs> Dante, you have a, an amazing history in terms of, of your career and, and how you started out and how you've continued to grow. And so um, would you just to start out with talk a little bit about um, your early glass blowing days and you're a Bay Area native, you're from yeah. Marin County. So, mm -hmm. yep. And uh, you started blowing glass right around the time you were 17, right? Uh, yeah, 15. I was in high school. Yeah. I started doing it. Yeah, I was born in uh, in the Bay Area. I grew up in Mill Valley. I moved away when I was 15. I was brought here against my will by my family when <laughs> I was a teenager. And I started blowing glass pretty much right away uh, because I could. My I don't know if, if everybody knows, but my dad was is, a, is a, an artist that works with glass. He's not a glass blower, but he had blown glass and he mostly made stained glass windows and stuff in the early 70s there was a big movement in the uh, bay area stained glass movement called the autonomous panel people just making a window for the sake of making a window it wasn't a practical functioning thing it's like a painting and there was a lot of people in the, in the bay area that did it my dad was one of those sort of original characters huh. he started coming up here to pilchuck in the 70s in the early 70s and uh in the summertime it's just glorious here and um, then the rains come and they last until the following summer. And I don't know that that would have stopped them from showing up here. He just wanted to be a part of this, this scene that was growing up here because of the Pilchuck School. And uh, so here, here, we, here we are. And I immediately started blowing glass because it was a glass blowing studio. Some hippie friends of my dad's had in downtown Seattle. And I, I was just completely captivated by it. I had absolutely no aspirations to follow in my dad's footsteps. I didn't, I wasn't, being an artist looked like that much fun to me as a kid. My uncle Tom is mm -hmm. an artist in San Francisco, just a, just right close to the gallery. And my uncle Joseph uh, is a painter in New York City. So my dad has two brothers out of three that are artists. And um, I wanted to play baseball or race motorcycles. Those were my only two career options I had. <laughs> one in a million chance that you would want one. Literally. And uh, I started blowing glass because I just enjoyed glass blowing. I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to express myself with molten glass and a pipe or anything like that. I just enjoyed this activity. And I really got into it and had really fortuitous set of circumstances where I was around the great people of this business. And by that, like the, the three main uh, sort of mentors that I had and great role models, the artist Benjamin Moore, Mm -hmm. who was a Northwest native and a um, sort of disciple of Chihuahua's. And um, the artist Richard Marquis, who identifies as a Bay Area native, but he's not. He's from Arizona. And now he <laughs> lives in, 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 in uh, Whidbey Island, so I see him. I've worked with him for a long time. And then, of course, Lino Talipietra has been a huge figure to everybody. You know, there's really not much that you can say about that guy that hasn't already been said, and none of it can be really overstated. He's the man. And he sort of imparted this language to myself and anybody else that was interested in listening, which was a lot of people, particularly here in the Northwest. There's a bunch of world-class uh, glassmakers here in the Northwest because of the Pilchuck School and because of Lino, because Lino came over to Pilchuck all the time. And then after a while, he just started coming here. And now he has a house here and a studio here. And he would live here half the time if he could. He's been, he's been in Toronto for the last year. He hasn't been here for a long. So anyway, I just started off. And uh, by the time I was in high school, or uh, high school was concluding, I knew what I wanted to do. And I never knew how lucky I was about that part until I was grown up. And I encountered people in their 30s that I went to high school with who still didn't know what they, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And uh, I managed to convince a couple of my high school friends, Preston Singletary, and uh, Paul Cunningham, Joey Camp, to start blowing glass too when we were in high school because it's fun. And uh, <laughs> there were opportunities. It was a studio that I worked at and I got those guys to help get them jobs there. And then also I was able to kind of build a team because at that point in time when I was a teenager, I was by far the youngest person in any glass studio that I ever went into and nobody wanted to help a kid. 
So suddenly I had my own crew and I was able to start making things. And I'd stay after work at the Glass Eye Studio where we all worked. And I started making my own things. And by the, I was 23 years old. I had an exhibition in here in town at the Traver Gallery uh, where I still show in Seattle. Um, and he, uh, the first show I had was these pieces called Whopper Vases that I made in the 80s. And he sold them all at the opening. And I was like, well, this is going to be easy. But that is the last time that ever happened. That I sold <laughs> at the opening. And, after, by, and then I, I, was, I was just on my own. When I was 23, I was, I was doing what I still do. I was just making work and, and having exhibitions and galleries. And uh, I still participate in the program at the Pilchuck Glass School. I can't say enough about that place. It's always uh, been a part of my life since I moved here. And actually, even before when I was a little kid, because my dad started talking about it when I was about nine, he, he started going up there when I was about nine. It started threatening to move us up here when I was about nine. So I was always aware of Pilchuck and the looming threat of having to maybe move to Seattle, which, which happened. And uh, I don't know what else to say, really. It's just been really, I've, I'm really lucky that I get to work with people that, that uh, are my best friends. Yanis Pozniak is a, a, a guy who came over here about 30 years ago from England to seek his fortune. And he worked for Shihuly for a while. And then he started working here with me. And it really, this process, uh, you, you can't do this by yourself. Mm -hmm. The hard part I do by myself, the making the patterns is the hard part. For me. People, last people, Pardon me. People will recognize Janusz from the first season of Blown Away. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. He was the he came in second, I think. I didn't see the show. <laughs> and and um, anyway, that part of, of it doesn't usually get talked about too much, but you can't do this by yourself. Right. I'm I'm the guy that makes all the decisions and it's my hands that shape it, but I can't lift some of these things they're huge. Some of the objects that we've been making are, are too big. I'm just physically, I can't do it. They're too the tall. Scale, the scale of your work is really amazing. It's, it's like, it doesn't, that's just kind of normal. It's sort of a natural way to make things for us. It doesn't feel like we're making giant things. And there's a limit to what we can do here in the studio, in, in my studio. But if we went, if we had traveled to a different studio, depending on what it is, I could probably make things even bigger. Uh, I don't know that there's a need to do that, but mm. this, the making things huge is like rising to this challenge. It's like part of this. It's the kind of the, the epitome of the craftiness element of, of working with glasses is uh, blowing glasses when you make something large, as long as you can make it nice. If you can make something giant, but it's not very well done, then it doesn't yeah. count. And um, it's just fun for us to, to push the limits of, of what you know, has been done already. Yeah. Tell, tell us about how you went from these opaque vessels to now these wild patterns, you know, and you, you, you can see the, the progression because you went through uh, the maze series where you see straight lines and geometric shapes. Yeah. And now, now you've got the prints, which are mm -hmm. very different and even you know, very complex designs. Um, a lot of texture. So how, how did that happen? Oh, uh, it was sometime in the late nineties. I started to, I started to make patterns. Uh, Lino Telepietra was uh, always on me to learn how to do things like that. And I was like, I don't, you know, it has to be idea driven for me. And I wasn't going to like learn how to make reticellos just to make some big goofy dragon stem goblet or something. I just, I didn't have an idea that I could apply it to. And, and, for whatever reason, he kept pushing me to push myself, uh, and and I did to make, to make I, reticello specifically, yeah, specifically to do that. And so then I made these objects that had a little element uh, in them uh, of reticello, and I don't have any examples. It was a short-lived series. And we should explain to so some people are not going to know what reticello is. So the acorn oh, that you the acorn that you saw in the video. Uh, yes. there, with the, the net pattern and there were air bubbles in each of those uh, diamonds. That's what reticello is. Okay. Oh, good. Gary just put up a good picture. Yeah. Don't worry. Go ahead. Yeah, Dante. that's a very traditional. That's a very traditional technique from I don't know 1600s. Uh, somebody on Morano came up with this idea to make these 
two interlocking surfaces that of canes that then trap that little bubble. And, and so it's a very traditional age old thing. And it very, there's nothing harder to do uh, in, in glass blowing that I've encountered than making a reticello. I, I do at best 50% of them come out good because they have to have, the pattern needs to be perfect. And there's only two kinds of reticello. There's good ones and there's shady ones, excuse my language. And so a lot of them just get thrown out. And, and um, the first things that I did were, I just started using some reticello uh, element in these other pieces, which I don't have any examples of to show you. And I immediately after that made, made an acorn. I just love the acorn as it exists in nature, this little nut with a beret on it. And I uh, thought it was a good idea to make a reticello acorn or else somebody else was probably gonna do it. And from there, it kind of morphed into doing uh, other pieces that had, I guess it was like some leaves that I did that were just entirely pattern and I just, I just I just kind of in a moment abandoned making all the opaque work that I had become known for uh, throughout the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s before I um, left it completely and just started exploiting the properties of the glass is that what you said before <laughs> yeah yes I like that because that's all this is it really it really is you know like I feel like at this point these things that I'm making and this is going to sound super corny but bear with me are like paintings or a print even, but they're not a print because there's only one, a mono print, if you will. But the print name comes from, uh, initially they look like a thumbprint or a fingerprint. That's yeah. where the, I've been asked about the name and that's kind of initially where that came from. And it also but reminds me of, of prints that you see on fabrics, on textiles. There's so many, I think, ways that you could uh, define that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, what I was going to say is the that- The fingerprint makes sense. The pieces are like, uh, like I'm, I'm excited about them because it's like a, it's a, it's a composition. It's a, it's a painting, if you will. That's the corny part, I was going to say. Uh, but they are. Like I've left behind the, the really precise glass blowing stuff with the handles and all the things that we used to do, like totally different work. And it's just about seeing what this, shit, this, this form came out, you know, the next day I make I make the pieces I do the, the, the patterns here on the plate and then we pick them up and make them into a piece and uh, we don't do that on the same day I pick up the pattern and I make uh, something like this this is the pattern all rolled up and I just make it into this cup this is a purple and green leaf or it will be someday and this little thing gets inflated it gets turned into a gigantic thing anyway so I make the patterns and we do this uh this takes quite a while to do. We pull lots of canes, I set them up, we heat them up in the fire, we pick them up, I make these things. And then on a Wednesday, typically, but not every Wednesday, I have five of these in the oven and um, I pick them up, gather on it twice and make a thing out of it. So that's, that's the process that you'll see after we film that happening. And um, I don't know, now I've lost my train of thought, but you were asking me. <laughs> Oh, there's a there's an example of that. What this will be? And you can see there's some behind me here on the, in the studio too. Oh, we don't have any sound. This okay. Thing. Yeah. There we go. All right. Yeah. So you could see the the piece before you blew it out, and then it becomes something like this. Yeah. And, and, and that piece is almost four feet tall. I mean, yeah, it's giant. The length on these yeah. is remarkable. I don't know how you hold that on the end of a pipe and get it to stay together. Yeah. <laughs> I have good helpers. I have yeah. I, I, the person I work with is fantastic, and he's also a lot taller than I am. <laughs> so he can, he can get it hot and come out and hold it down. I'd have to dig a hole in my studio floor to be able to do that. <laughs> Cause I can't, I'm not, I'm not tall enough to hold it up like this. So he does that while I squeeze it flat, you know? Cool. I don't want to get folks, too into all that. Folks, feel free to uh, begin to put some questions in chat and uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. Um, Dante, do you want to uh, show us around your studio? All right. Do I do that? <laughs> Here we're, we'll switch. What does that mean? Get over there. How far are you? 
Oh, sorry. There we go. This place, uh, this has been my studio for, oh boy, I don't even know, 30 years maybe. Like, and it is a uh, office. It functions now as the place where I do all the patterns. In the past, I didn't do patterns. I didn't need that. And then also as a uh, storage for all my work back on that wall are earlier works going back. Some of them are from the eighties actually. And then we can um, see, we can see your earlier works here, the opaque pieces. Yeah, some good examples here. <clears throat> Chartreuse trio from the 1990s or early 2000s, I don't know. This is. This is never leaving. It's my favorite thing ever. That's and, never, you know, never leaving the studio. Nope. Well, I mean, it will if I take it home. But yeah, you, know. you should have it in your home if it's your favorite thing. <laughs> no, I don't like looking at this stuff too much. I mean, uh, okay. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> I need to change my visual landscape. So it'll, it might make a tour of that. Place. Right. But excuse me for a second. Or shut the door. Hey, hey, hey. Guys, <laughs> quiet down. It's a working studio. <laughs> the, the hot shop, which we will see in a few minutes, is has has folks working in there. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, and then yeah, you can see the mosaic bases from the, also from the nineties, the two and into the two thousands uh, that we made. That was a really those were really fun things to do. And uh, I don't know, just I've saved a lot of this these uh, early pieces because I know I won't make them again. You know, mm, like, like right. any artist does. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of just, um, this is a mix of mostly good ones, things I'm keeping, and then there's funky things too that I haven't disposed of yet or recycled or whatever. And then I keep motorcycles here because, well, because it's my space and I can keep motorcycles here if I want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> Early in your career, you were uh, in included in a uh, American craft exhibition that was at the White House, and your oh, yeah. work your work ended up on the cover of the catalog with Hillary Clinton. And the pieces, the yellow pieces back there, are similar. There we go. That's right. That's it. <laughs> no, that's yeah. the Smithsonian Magazine. I do. I happen to have a those are the pieces. The book here, yeah. as you can see. There, and there's and one. Think, yeah. There's there's one where where Hillary's with these pieces as well, right? That's on the on the back. Ah. Of the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, it was pretty it's pretty exciting. Early early in your career, you you it, you had a, an incredible um, experience and opportunity there. I your did. Career just I exploded. Did. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, stuff like you know stuff like this, obviously. Uh, didn't hurt, but also, you know, I was here for the wave of studio glass, especially in the Northwest. Again, you know, Pilchuck School and uh, the, the, the community that's here, and specifically in the Seattle area, was it was a great place to be a, a young person working with glass, I'll tell you that. And um, I was able to just really focus, and I got to work with all the world class people. You know, I, I worked on Chihuly teams when I was a teenager. And I worked with mm. Billy Morris and, and Benjamin Moore specifically was a really big deal to me, as was Richard Marquis and then Lino, as I keep referencing. Right. And, and lots of other people that I can't really even, you know, name at the moment. But um, yeah, it's, it was a good time to be here in the yes. Northwest. And, so, you know, people still come out here to seek their fortune. Right. We have a couple of questions. Sure. Yeah, well, there's actually two... Two questions from Maria Porges, and maybe we address one of oh, them. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm one of them first is, um, so a maze is something you usually try to find your way out of. Were you thinking about that when you titled this series Maze? No, I was not. That, that never occurred to me. No, there's nothing behind it. it. Just, that was, look, I'm not good at naming stuff. I've struggled my entire <laughs> career with titling things. It's been hard. <laughs> And, and um, I've been ridiculed in the past, like the Whopper base, as I referenced earlier. If I could go, if I had a time machine, I'd change that. And um, the maze thing, just that's just what they look like to me. Oh, you just went, we just lost. 
the audio. Just then. Okay, now we're back. Yeah, all right. So no, but thanks, Maria. That's a good question. And then, nice and then not, not exactly a follow-up, but uh, also from Maria. And particularly when you see your mosaic uh, vases there, you know, what influence do you see Dick Marquis is having on your work? Oh, given huge. that he's done so much in Marini. Yeah, I started working with him when I was uh, in my early 20s. I've known him since I was a little kid, literally, in the Bay Area. And um, in fact, I remember seeing his work in, in Oakland at the museum when I was probably nine or 10. My dad showed me it. I said, look, it's a teapot, a Dick Marquis teapot with all the little Marinis and stuff. And at that time, I was like, well, can you use it to make tea? What is it for? And my dad said, no, it's a sculptural vessel. It's like just, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of art. And I was like, that doesn't, that's not making sense to me. That doesn't have anything to do with story, but it's just popped into my head. And uh, he moved up here in the early 80s, and we started working together because I was an assistant of his uh, on uh, when he would teach workshops and stuff like that. And we became really friendly really quick with our, combined, our shared love of this stuff. And uh, we were both really enamored with the work of Carlos Scarpa, who was a, a Venetian uh, uh, architect in sort of mid-century. He made these really... Um, beautiful contemporary objects for the Venini factory in the 40s and post-war in the 40s uh, that were comprised of just Mirini. And, and uh, Dick and I started figuring out how he made those. And we knew how he did it, but we just hadn't done it. Like making a, making a, a plate of Mirini and getting it hot and picking it up on a blowpipe. People weren't doing that in the United States 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And Dick and I started doing it together. I did my things and he did his things, but we work together on, on them. And uh, now it's pretty commonplace. And it was an, you know, it's an age old technique to pick up the Marini and stuff. But Marquis has had a huge influence on me. I don't think anything I make looks anything like what he makes, which I'm proud to say. But um, he's, this, this business, being an artist in this particular medium, you need to have people that you can learn from. If, you, if you're the best person around, you're, that's it. There's nowhere to go. And uh, even Lino, who's the best person around, continues to evolve and, and try things, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess the point of saying that is that, like, I had no formal education in that. I didn't go off to art school like I was encouraged to do. When I was coming out of high school, I just started blowing glass all the time because I knew that here in the Northwest, at, especially at that time, all the, all the good people and the people that I could learn from were here, not at CCAC not at RISD or anywhere else. And so, uh, I mean, I like, to, I like to underscore that point to if there's any young people out there watching this that you need to find, you need, to, you need not like a formal mentoring or, or apprenticeship or anything, but you need to work around people that are better than you. And that's what I've always done is, is uh, worked around people that, you know, looked up to people and learned from other folks. And Marquis and Benjamin Moore, especially the two Americans and then Lino, I keep referencing, but that's obvious. Yeah. Great advice. Uh, this is going back in time a little bit. So it's amazing that you were on the, the cover of the Smithsonian catalog there. Is there any, who were the jurors who sort of made that? Uh, uh, I think it was judgment. probably my mom, my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I, was, I wasn't in charge of that. I mean, the, 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 the curator, the White House collection was put together by Michael Monroe, who was a curator at the Renwick Gallery in the 1990s. The Clintons put together the collection. They said, we want 1993 is the year of the American craft. Let's get 75 of the best craft artists together and put it in the White House. And that's just what they did. And wow. uh, they called and asked me if I did it, if I do it. And I said, well, do I get to meet the president? And he said, yes, you do. So I gave him a piece. I would have given him one anyways. And I, I uh, gave him a piece of glass. And then I got to go to the White House and meet the president and all that stuff. And um, it was just dumb luck that I got on the cover. I don't, I didn't, I don't know who picked that. And, and Michael Monroe is the person that picked all the people to be in the show. I don't know if he was responsible for the publicity and stuff like that, but bless his heart for everything he did for me. <laughs> So before we go in the hot shop, I think we need to take the opportunity to talk about your motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> what, what have you got there uh, and how gonna... crazy how crazy do you get on those, Dante? I don't get crazy. I'm okay, crazy. you don't, do you race them or do you ride them? Uh, I ride, I ride, uh, I have a, I have a Ducati 
that I ride at the racetrack. I haven't in a while, but I just do track days on it. I don't compete. Uh, and then I have a 1982 Kawasaki Eddie Lawson replica. This is a really collectible bike, something I've wanted since I was a kid when they came out. And I had to be grown up before I could afford one. And it's heavily modified. It's a vintage super bike. Uh, and then I have a couple of KTM Dukes, which are just the best machines for riding around the city. And I have two because they're not very reliable. One of them's always broken. And in fact, one of them's broken right now. So I ride the black one until the yellow one gets fixed. And, you know, motorcycle, I just grew up in, I grew up in California. It's like, it was part of life. And, and my dad was cool about it. And so I always had some two-wheel motorized thing. And right. uh, before I, and, and I also rode mountain bikes on Mount Temple Pius. I was gonna mention that. You, do, you ride mountain bikes as well. I do all the time here in the Northwest, but I started doing it when they were inventing it in Marin in the 70s when I was a little kid on our BMX bikes riding down Mount Temple Pius. Uh, we'd see the woolly hippie from Fairfax that built the first mountain bikes. <laughs> cool. Anyway. Well, shall we go in the hot shop? Sure. In the hot shop today, uh, my buddy Yanush that I keep talking about, he he and I kind of are, we're sort of partners in this glass blowing studio, except I'm the boss. So we're not really partners, but it's like he uses it as much as I do. And he helps me make my work. Sometimes I help him, but most of the time he gets other people to come in and he does a variety of different things. Uh, whereas I just use it lately. I just make my work. You know, I do what I've already explained. I make the patterns and I do the pieces and uh, I usually work two to three days a week. He works the other days in the, in the old days. I spent a lot of time uh, making wine glasses because it just mm -hmm. keeps you sharp. It's uh, just, Beautiful. it was sort of, a, it's always been sort of a hobby of mine. It's never really been part of my professional practice. And Yanish and I got really good at making these together. And now it only happens like once or twice a year. Those are beautiful. Uh, and uh, just, I don't know. Anyway, uh, we'll go into the hot shop where Nushi's working. They got back to work. Oh, well, here's more examples of really nice ones that I'm keeping in yeah. colors and whatnot. Making goblets isn't easy, right? Well, it's not that hard for me, but yeah, it's, it's pretty Is it easy. sort of like scales for you? Yeah, there you go. I've, yeah. yeah, that's right. It is. It's, it's really, it's practicing. And, Right. I, I probably should do it. I do them in parts. Like you can see uh, on the on the floor here are the tops of a lot of, of them. Like in the morning, I come in and I make a few of these to warm up, you know, yeah. just to get loose for whatever we're doing. And they get piled up here on the floor. Oh. And then at a certain point in time, all of these will get loaded into an oven. And one by one, I'll make the stems. But here's a stem. I'm a broken one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the stem and then Oops. Yanish brings, brings over the bowl. He'll bring over the bowl and we stick them together. It's a very traditional Venetian way of making uh, wine glasses. It's how they did it. And it just, you need to have a really, really light touch to be able to do stuff like this. And that light touch really goes a long ways to making anything, you know, like if you make big, giant, heavy stuff and you can do this too, you're you're really, you got a leg up on everything. You know, if you only make big giant stuff, you can't, you don't have, you don't, you don't glean the, that, that, uh, that aspect of being in touch with the process. Being nimble. Yeah, and, and having a light touch. Lino says, I forget how Lino phrases it in his English, but he does a good job of, my hands became very light or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna, the hot shop is just across the hall here. So, as you can see, that finish at the bench is gone or something. The studio. We can't hear you very well. Okay, that's because of the noise. Okay, now we can hear you fine. I think it might I think it's the way the iPad was being held. Camera person. Uh, this studio was put together in 1984 and it was run as sort of a little, it was four or five people uh, all together. And then by 1990, I'd sort of taken it over. My 
my dad wasn't interested in it. He didn't really have a blood blast that much either. And then, and broke the whole thing. Like, it's a really, we can make these big giant pieces out of that. And this little space is 450 square feet because of all the, all the improvements that he's done to the, uh, all the equipment. And it, every year when we rebuild the furnace, which you have to do pretty much every year, we refine little details of stuff that we you know, are both going to use, whether it's like how the bench is set up or what it's, it, it, you have to, you have to kind of uh, do all this stuff yourself. You can't really, nobody really can just buy all this equipment. Now you kind of can nowadays, but in the past you could you have to make it. Very and very few artists have have hot shops right at, in their studio and in their building. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that, that's that's true. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if there's if people have questions about the hot shop. That's fine. Otherwise, I think we've seen it. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> so we did get a question. Yeah. We did get a question come back on the goblets and the question from uh, Andrew Page. Is the story true that Lino told you that if you wanted to be able to blow anything in glass, you had to learn how to blow goblets? Uh, yeah, what, what, he, um, what, what Lino said to me when I was 19, when I first met him, he didn't speak any English at that time. He said uh, that if you work for for seven years with the same person making wine glasses, you can make anything. And that is a super over, oversimplification, but there, there, is a, there is a truth to it. And um, that person wasn't Yanush, it was my high school buddies. Cause you know, when I was young, I was all about making wine glasses, regardless of what we said, I just enjoyed doing it. And uh, I never really took that to heart per se, but I think it's, I think it's true that you're gonna get good at glass blowing if you pay attention. And that's what you, you know, do work with the same, working with the same person is really, uh, it really makes a big difference. Like having your team together and that, that doesn't, that part, that part doesn't get really uh, explored that much in this business. Cause it's really not central to the story of the art, you know, the right. work and the inspiration and stuff, but you can't, you just can't do a good job by yourself. And as a, as a kid, I saw people blowing glass by themselves all the time. And it's just, it was just a gnarly struggle. And, uh, you know, Chihuly was the person that went over to Europe first, the first American, and saw the Venetians uh, blowing glass in teams. And he came back and started doing it that way mm -hmm. after 1968. And um, that's the way I grew up doing it, was working with, uh, with other people and, and having a team. And, and I started at the bottom. I was like the punty boy when I was a teenager two team Benjamin Moore or even Mark with you know and Lino a little bit I worked with Lino when I was younger so and the, uh, pun, the punty is explain that oh the punty is uh when you transfer the piece you know you transfer the piece off the blowpipe so you can finish it you know you, you right uh, transfer it to the bottom and then you can open it up the guy that brings that punty is in, in the olden days was the punty boy but now I'm sure <laughs> now we say punty person there you go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Could be anything, but in Murano, there was it was only boys. That came yeah, out. we we got a question, Dante, uh, asking if you could talk about the wall collection you're standing in front of. Oh, this is uh, a series that I did um, starting in the early two thousands, I think. Uh, I always really admired um, the work of Martinuzzi who is also a, happens to be, a, he was an architect in Venice as well, who designed objects for the Venini factory. And in the twenties, there was a period when there was a big shift in Venetian glassmaking. And they refer to it as actually, it goes back to the turn of that century. They call it the Novecento, the 900. And in the beginning, at the turn of the century in 1900, the first sort of difference in Venetian glassmaking was that they had Art Nouveau came in. I skip right over that. I'm not a fan of Art Nouveau. Right after that, in the 20s, in the early 20s, became this deco period in, in Venetian glassmaking, specifically at the Venini factory. The dude that owned the Venini factory was a really um, open-minded individual who invited outside people into the factory to design objects, including Martinuzzi. 
one of the things that Martinucci did was made these very beautiful deco uh, vessels. And there's an image uh, in one of the books I have of, it's an image of an image from 1925 of all these pieces lined up um, in, a catalog, in a, a page out of a catalog. That was how they made the catalog was they said, click and took a picture of all these objects. Oops, we lost your sound again. I think it's from the iPad. I made this uh, big giant wall of these pieces. It took about a year to make uh, this big installation and it went off to, it's in a museum in Japan now, but in the meantime, I made a bunch of these more consumer friendly sized ones. Um, and this has just been sitting here for a long time. That's all. It's just kind of on display. Great. There's a few of them around. Uh, uh, Dante, we got a question also about how do you protect against earthquakes? Or is that not a problem where you are? And I'll <laughs> add, or do you care? <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to do? I know. It's like, I, I, it's like there was, there was, the last big quake we had, uh, some stuff got broken. And uh, the pieces weren't even that tippy. I, no, I just, I, you and I were coincidentally just talking about this the other day, and you said you're yeah. just taking risks because you don't have, you move things around all the time in your all studio, time, so, yeah. and so you don't have anything secured. Obviously, right. there are ways to secure glass and to make it safe in earthquake my, country. In my house, I have a couple of Lino pieces, amongst other things, but the Lino pieces are sort of tippy, and um, they're, they're glued down with a little silicone you know, like enough that they're really held down. But if, when I, when I need to move them, I twist them off yeah. and they, they come apart. Yeah. Uh, you can use, you can use museum wax too, but it, it's not as uh, absolute as the uh, uh, silicone. The silicone. Yeah. yeah. So, so I don't know. I, I, I think I, I, I think I probably just rather not talk about that. How's <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so back to the current series. So in these these print series, you're making rondelles first and then cutting those into into pieces. Can you describe what the process of making a rondelle is? Uh, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, the way I'm doing it, I would take a bunch of canes, I'd cut them, to about exactly this long and fill up a plate. It would be about, it's actually a big, the plate's in the studio, but it's a big plate. The, the pickup is 16 inches of cane. So it's a huge plate with like a hundred of these sticks on it or more. And then it goes into the fire and I have to make, a, I have to figure out the 3.14 of that. We have, a, we have a caliper that does that so I can figure out the pie. And then I have to make a wheel on my blow pipe at a glass, and then at the at the appropriate moment, Yanush comes out of the fire, and I roll them up, and suddenly I have this big cylinder made of canes, or yeah, made of canes on the blowpipe, and then a whole bunch of stuff happens. It gets twisted, and then in this case, I just neck it down and open it. A rondelle is a very traditional blown glass uh, way of making sheet glass. It's probably how sheet glass was made initially in the early days before they had the technology to make sheet glass. So this was the way I realized making the sheet glass that I need to create this, these compositions. So you have to pull a lot of cane and then I have to spend a day making these and it takes about four of these to make one piece and then there's a bunch of scraps left over. And, and to get that, you have to really kind of spin the blowpipe, right? Yeah, at the end you spin it open, spin it flat. That's right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, been, it's been done forever. Yeah, it's fun to watch, though. It's <laughs> <laughs> it looks it looks very impressive. Right, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there was a question about uh, rebuilding the furnace. Like, why do you have to rebuild the the furnace each year? Is that uh, an electrical uh, thing? What's the no? The furnace is still gas powered. I think I have an electric furnace in my future, as probably everybody will. But uh, at the moment, there, it's gas powered, and um, it has a crucible in it. That that furnace stays on from like September until June. We turn off in the summertime. But the rest of the time, the furnace is on twenty four seven. That's how the last one 
furnaces work. It's like you don't turn them on and off. It just stays on. And it's full of glass, which is corrosive. And, and so is 2000 degree environment. And so that, that, that uh, crucible that's in the furnace just wears out. And, and after a while, it starts to come apart really slowly. And that leaches into the glass and the glass gets funky. So every year we, or every other year, sometimes we risk it and skip a year, but we have to pull the furnace out of the, off the wall, you know, out of the, behind the heat shield, take it all apart, replace that big crucible and put it all back together. It's a nasty, icky job. I don't do it. Other people. <laughs> but it has to be done. It has to be done. Yeah. 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 So Dante, your print series is, is your brand new series that you've been working on for the past year. And yeah. you know, these very detailed patterns um, exist on, on these pieces. I'm wondering, do you have a vision of where a, a piece is going to go in terms of, of your pattern? Do you know how that's gonna turn out or? No. Or, you know, I mean, how has this evolved? Uh, I think it must have been before the Zoom thing started. I show you the pieces that are on the floor that we made last Wednesday. Right. Going in Tuesday night, I was like, okay, these are going to be the best ones ever. I can't wait. They all sucked. They, they, we, I just, for a variety of reasons, I missed the mark on, on the whole load of them. And that's the nature of how this goes. You know, it's like, it's super rare that I would get five good ones in a day. I typically, I think I probably average three. And last week, it looks like I got one, maybe. And um, I can't, you know, you can't always anticipate what it's going to be. And that's kind of, in a way, that's sort of the good part, you know. And that's as spontaneous as things ever get for me. And that's not even spontaneous. That's just fate. Because I don't, I'm not, my work isn't about spontaneity and stuff. It's like, I have a pretty, I'm, I pretty much know what's going to happen. Or at least I think I do. And the things that go wrong are most often my fault. Like it was a stupid idea to try to mix those two blue colors together. They don't look good together. It's things like that. And you can't always, you can't always figure that out until you've made a piece. One of the things I do or I try to do is to see what the colors and the patterns are gonna look like is I make a cup like this. My house is full of these drinking glasses like this. I don't know if you can see it or not. People are gonna ask if you sell them because I've been asked. Oh yeah, I do. They're they start at fifteen thousand bucks each, and they go up to twenty five. <laughs> Any takers? That's why I thought the answer to that question was going to be no. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, I don't make them sell them. But uh, that's you know that's the closest I can get to seeing what things might look like is by just doing some small scale thing like this. And this is like for looking at the color more than anything else. The pattern is it's not. I mean, this is just a tiny little setup. It still took an hour or so to chop and set up. And this, this is what you get after you lay out the plate that you showed us earlier with the, yeah, sometimes, with the rondelles some, that were cut. That's right. And sometimes yeah. I'll do that first. Like I'll make one rondelle and chop it up and do a cup and see if it looks like it's worth pursuing. And so far it always has. I haven't made one that I was like, ew, I don't like that color. And um, then I'll proceed right. with making the, the full size piece. Okay. Well, I'm sad to say we're at the end of our time together. It has flown by and um, Dante, we want to thank you for um, being with us this morning. Uh, sure. we, we want to thank you for contributing your extraordinary talent and art um, to us here at the Montague Gallery and to the world. Um, I want to uh, remind everyone that the show runs through May 22nd. And if you are in the San Francisco area, please come and visit. We are open uh, regular bu business hours from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. Um, we do require social distancing and masks, but there's plenty of room in here, plenty of room. So um, you shouldn't have any problems. And it makes it so fun to see this in person. So please come visit us if you can. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, and once again, we will be uh, posting this Zoom. So with that, um, once again, Dante, thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you, okay. everybody, for coming up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.